Grace, mercy, and peace be yours in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text is taken from our reading out of Jeremiah. I read again Jeremiah 23, verse 16. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you, feeling you with vain hopes. They speak visions of their own minds, not from the mouth of the Lord. Here is the reading of our text. May God add his blessings to the reading of his word. Amen. As a Lutheran pastor, there are some general expectations of me as I step into a pulpit. For example, I am expected to preach about the Bible and not about who I think should be elected. My opinions on the presidential race, trade tensions, gun controls, the latest movies, or whatever are only of value if they help us understand what the Bible is saying or if the biblical text helps us understand the world around us. Next, I'm expected to proclaim the Bible within the context of the Lutheran confessions. That does not mean that everybody here needs to be an expert on the Book of Concord, but it is expected that if any such expert happened to hear one of my sermons, they will not find anything in them that conflicts with the historic Christian and Lutheran faith. There are other expectations naturally. One of them is that I will proclaim the whole counsel of God. In fact, that particular term, the whole counsel of God, is in many official call documents. This has led Lutherans typically to use a lectionary series with assigned readings for each Sunday. Preachers thus have texts each year that cover the whole counsel of God. This particular expectation, though, can present the preacher with a problem. You see, the whole counsel of God covers all sorts of things. A quick glance at the table of duties in Luther's small catechism reveals that the whole counsel of God includes directions for civil government. But if you are not in government, the sermon might not be of much interest to you. The whole counsel of God includes counsel for employers. But if you're not an employer, you might find the message not all that relevant. And then there are all those passages in the Bible pointed to pastors. Such a text might be a great one to use if your congregation is a congregation full of seminary students or maybe at a pastor's conference. But what about a typical congregation where the vast majority of people listening do not have an advanced theological degree? Might the congregation be put to sleep by such a sermon? Well, I hope not. Because the whole counsel of God indeed does apply to preachers. And such is our Old Testament lesson today. That's part of the counsel for us preachers. Therefore, part of the message today is actually directed at me. Uh, sorry. But, <laughs> but to tell you the truth, the last thing I want to have God tell me when I arrive on Judgment Day is, I did not send Rickert, yet he ran. I did not speak to him, yet he preached. This passage should make all preachers tremble just a little bit. However, this passage is also pointed to you, the congregation, as listeners. After all, what good is a sermon if nobody is listening? So there's something in here for both of us, all of us. First, we need to quickly have some background about our Old Testament lesson so we can understand the context into which our reading comes. Jeremiah was active from about 626 onward for about 40 years. 
Near the end of his ministry, the Babylonian Empire conquered Judah and carried the people off into captivity. Jeremiah was allowed to stay in the land, though, because through the prophet, God had warned the Judean people that they should surrender. And if they had surrendered, they would have been allowed to stay in the land, just like Jeremiah was allowed to stay in the land. But they were hard-hearted, and they would not listen to Jeremiah. And so they fought against the Babylonians, and they lost, and they were deported. The Babylonians, however, as I said, appreciated the advice that Jeremiah had given, and so allowed to stay him in the land. And some of the other people were allowed to stay, and they were still hard-hearted people, and they still rebelled, and Jeremiah still gave them the same advice to surrender, and the Babylonians would let them stay, and they still refused, and instead they actually kidnapped Jeremiah and spirited him away to Egypt, where he apparently died. According to tradition, he was a martyr, and he was actually cut in two. And that tradition says that in our reading in Hebrews, that's Jeremiah that they're referring to as having been cut in two. That's the big context. Our Old Testament reading comes from a time before the fall of Judah. Aside from Jeremiah, who was a true prophet of the Lord, there were many false prophets. Many of these false prophets even had official status in the king's court. Their speciality was to tell people what they wanted to hear and then say, thus says the Lord. So you tell me what you want, me, want God to say, and then I will tell you what God says. And it just so happens to be exactly what you wanted God to say. And then I will say, thus says the Lord. And everybody walks away happy. This is a violation of the second commandment. As Luther explained the commandment, we should fear and love God that we do not curse, swear, use satanic arts, lie or deceive by his name, but call upon it in every trouble, pray, praise, and give thanks. While these false prophets were lying and deceiving by the Lord's name all over the place. So is every preacher throughout the ages and right down to our present day who proclaims anything except the pure word of God and yet calls their fancies the word of God. This is the first lesson for me as a preacher. But it is also a lesson for you as hearers. The sermon needs to be supported by the Word of God, that is the Bible. Anything else is a violation of the Second Commandment. And I have to specify that I mean the Bible because back in the 70s I read a new book that was out, Healing the Inner You or something like that. I don't remember the title now. And the guy had revelations from God which he recorded in his book. And then in his chapter, he would quote that revelation as scripture. Hogwash. The Bible is the revealed word of God, the inscripturated word of God. You don't quote, if you want to quote my sermon today, this week, go ahead. But don't say, thus says the Lord. Say, thus said my pastor. There's a big difference there. Trust me. Concerning these false prophets back in, uh, in Jeremiah's day, uh, the Lord said, I did not send the prophets, yet they ran. I did not speak to them, yet they prophesied. In the Lutheran traditions, we have typically guarded against this by insisting that anyone who preaches has a proper call. In our day and age, this issue has actually been magnified, people running without a call, because anyone can proclaim their views on the Internet or, and so forth. Without a proper call, they preach their dreams and not the Word of God. But the modern pastor preacher is like the high priest in the Old Testament. You see, God not only appointed the high priest, but also told us what the high priest's job was. 
So a duly called and ordained pastor is not only called by God through the congregation, but God also tells him through the scriptures and not through his dreams and not through his visions, but through the scriptures what he is to preach. False preachers proclaim their lies to those who despise the word of God. Not that they say they despise the word of God. Few people are that bold. In fact, they typically say the exact opposite. This is consistent with how false preachers and false prophets have acted throughout the ages. Just imagine, if I'm going to teach lies, do I start off by saying, now pay attention, I'm going to lie to you. How many people would pay attention? No, I'm going to say, I'm going to tell you the truth. Trust me, God says this. So we have an interesting story in 1 Kings chapter 22 where we find a faithful prophet named Melchiah who warned the kings of Israel and Judah not to engage in battle. While all the false prophets were saying, go for it, yeah, you're going to win, you're going to win. They said this because they knew that the kings wanted to go to war. The false pro prophet, uh, and of course, like I said, Melchiah said, do that and you're going to lose. The false prophet Zedekiah struck Melchiah on the cheek and said, how did the Spirit of the Lord go from me and speak to you? Zedekiah used the name of the true God in his rebuke of the prophet. The king even though he knew that Melchiah was a true prophet and Zedekiah was just blowing smoke, was just a court lackey, did what he wanted to do, listened to the false prophet, and they even had uh, Melchiah jailed. Time and time again in the book of Jeremiah, the false prophets speak in the name of the true God their lies. The king knew they were just blowing smoke also, but he feared what would happen to him if he obeyed the Lord, and so he followed the bad advice of the false prophets and suffered the consequences. Here we have a warning of warning not just to preachers, but to hearers also. The Bible is clear about so many things. However, culture and family and leaders of our nations and even false ch church leaders often pressure us to accept what God does not. The ultimate end of such leaders and cultures is destruction. For preachers, the message is the same as it is for hearers. Don't cave in. The road for the faithful may include great difficulty, earthly rejection and so forth. Jeremiah was once beat and put in the stocks. Another time he was arrested and thrown into a dry cistern. He was constantly abused by the false prophets and priests, but he clung to the truth of God's word. He clung to the righteous branch that he foresaw in the verses just before what we started reading he sees the righteous branch, who is Jesus. Though Jeremiah died long before Christ was born, nonetheless he entered glory as Jesus' faithful servant. Now, this lesson is full of warning. It is a law passage. But it also ends with, Let the prophet who has a dream tell the dream. And let him who has my word speak my word faithfully. What has straw in common with wheat, declares the Lord. To put this another way, we are never going to stop the false preachers from preaching. Just ain't going to happen. We are never going to drive all the false churches out of business. Ain't going to happen. Don't worry about it. For us, we are to stick with God's truth as revealed in sacred scriptures. 
That is to say, we are to cling to the righteous branch, our Lord Jesus. There are all sorts of things people want to hear about. Who should I vote for? Should I take this or that job? How should I invest my money? Is global warming real or not? Should I get a flu shot? What does God say about all of these issues? Well, all these issues are actually okay for you to talk about among yourself and ask those questions. You want to talk about global warming, God bless you, talk about it. The pastor preacher, though, realizes that these things are not the proper topic for a sermon. You do not preach on a subject, or should not preach on a subject anyway, that is simply timing, or simply because I think it will make my sermon relevant. It would be easy to take these topics and just drop in a few Bible verses so that it might seem like I'm speaking for the Lord. I've read a lot of sermons. I started reading them pretty faithfully when I was in the seminary, and I read this one. This is the truth. It's a 19th century Christmas sermon. And the text is that Mary lays the child in uh, the manger because there's no room for him in an inn. Well, what are mangers used for typically? Are they typically, typically cradles? No, they're feeding troughs. The Christmas sermon was about the care and feeding of cattle. I use the word sermon there very loosely, by the way. God doesn't care how you care and feed for your cattle as long as how you do it is not promoting sin. The same thing can be said about investing your money or what have you. Invest your money or whatever you have in a way that seems to be in harmony with the generally revealed will of God. That's the most you're going to get out of me. I'm not going to recommend this stock or that stock or bond or future or whatever. Use the brain God put in your head. <laughs> From the pulpit, you have the right to hear, and I have the responsibility to preach the pure word of God. That word is rightly divided into two main doctrines, law and gospel. The law is hard. To use Jeremiah's picture, it is like a hammer that breaks to pieces our hard hearts. The hammer is swinging in our Old Testament lesson. It kind of makes you tremble. It swings against all free, false preachers. It swings against all who promote and support false preachers. It asks the false preachers, where is that in the Bible? Are you taking verses out of context to make it work? When did God say that? But even more, it asks, where is the righteous branch? Where is forgiveness? Where is eternal hope? For both pastor and congregation, these are important questions. If you want stock tips, go to a financial advisor. Trust me, he's going to give you better tips than I will. If you want advice on the care and feeding of animals, go to somebody with a degree in animal husbandry or a vet. They are better qualified to give you those answers than a preacher. If you want to know about global warming, go to a qualified environmental scientist. Trust me, he is better equipped to speak on the subject probably for hours and hours than I am. From the pulpit, we are to hear about the Ten Commandments and prayer, baptism in the Lord's Supper, confession and absolution, sin and redemption, hell and heaven, death and life. Here you will hear about God and his eternal love for us in Christ Jesus our Lord. Here you will hear about living in the light of your Christian faith. Here you will hear about justification by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. It is God's will that the church is centered on such things. For me as a preacher, 
I must make sure that I bring this message. You as listeners are to hear, ponder, and make such things a part of your everyday lives. As a preacher, I must avoid all doctrines of men. For you as listeners, you are to ask such questions like, where is this found in the Bible? How does this apply in my life? And most importantly, how does this point to Jesus? God has given us all sorts of institutions that provide all sorts of beneficial aid to us. Things like school. Show of hands, who has been to school in their life? Okay. God gave us schools to teach us stuff. It's a good thing. Okay. He's given us the Better Business Bureau. He's given us governments. He's given us manufacturing businesses. He's given us the police and I could go on and on, and so could you. All of these good things are blessings from God. But he has only given one institution, if you will, whose main job it is, whose sole job it is, is to proclaim the full counsel of God, to proclaim God's love in Christ Jesus for us, and that is the church. And that is why we are here. That is why here at our church, it is still all about Jesus. That is what God wants us to be about. In fact, that is God, what God wants, not just for us, but for the entire church on earth. Amen. May the peace of God, which passes human understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.